beginning of November to um, the system-wide needs program. I want to say that I participated in the registration at Kennedy School, and it was very good, and school. Um, <clears throat> before I ever Our team was here who had done the work, the attendance, and would you ask them to stand, please, so that we could know who. Absolutely, take um, this time to ask them to stand. And I, I'll just give them a round of applause. Excellent. Um, really did a job. Very well behaved. Speaker was. But my question I have, what are we doing with mental health? Yeah, absolutely. Just held on Friday and received and roll it out. Um, some um, so again, we're just kind of 48 hours. Um, 48 but I jumped the gun all this month because there's just so much moment going with teachers with the three thousand i mean three hundred thousand first um part of that training for this in december of this year on how those trainings are going and just a little more information um from the schools so add um teresa wilhite who's here with us, director of behavioral health the past um in our other train the trainer trauma informed program we've had nola public school staff trained so that we can provide the different, um, opportunities internally as well so i mentioned that with tulane and the uh, coalition of passionate schools period with the agencies in the city um i didn't know that problem because as i talk to mental issues with their kids i'm we will refer you to an agency, but we can lose kids if we have kids out here struggling and aren't the uh, available resources are not there. Absolutely. So, and I think to highlight on the other side, it's also important to know providers to provide clinical services on site. They need the time and space to do that. Senate, Mr. Parker. Comment doing, I know, uh, chronic absenteeism and addressing that. Somebody has to do that work. And, um, it's the individuals that you recognize here today who couldn't be here, and I just want to thank you again. I also want to point out for board members, uh, speaking with someone from John F. Kennedy on Friday, all their registered students transporting to early voting on November the 1st. So if you would like to join them, vote in with the Kennedy Cougars and you're allowed to that trauma, how that treated trauma being normalized manifests in school. I think what we heard is that under the rug, community violence, it could be on and on and on. But when something takes a step and get the support service that you need, kind of be well my name is Jennifer Campbell dr. Tammy major the cafeteria as well as the picture on the top right um, that is going to be our early childhood literacy uh, early childhood center excuse me that will be actually located um, across the street from Martin Berman's campus that will be uh, first through eighth grade so I'm actually turn it over now to mrs. Knox our principal at Martin Berman elementary where highlight ACSA's initiatives that and support families with literacy learning. We know that 
school. Providing the real, the real stands for real time. We also have been able to purchase accelerator books to build classroom libraries, also build incentives in place for students and their families for our academic success. And once again, a few of our hi uh, highlights that's going on here at the Beta Club induction, which actually takes place tomorrow. Um, I will be at Berman, our literacy night, and our winter concert, which will be, we work hard first, and then we play later. And we wanted just to highlight, these are our students here at Martin Berman Charter School, and this is the work that we're doing thus far. And one of the other initiatives, well, another um, structures that a theme rather that we put into place this year is that um, I am insisting that each and every water begins to steam. And I need every team to put forth that one extra degree of effort to push, to put forth the effort every single day. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you. Great job. I heard a couple of great things, especially that push from Bessie that we have our literacy piece played all ahead of the game. Thank you and kudos to you for that. Thank you. Adult literacy at the We will be having our literacy program, our, our literacy at our school, and that's going to be multi fold oh, piece. Right. Thank you. Any Thank questions, you. any comments, board members? Hearing none. If, if I could just say to see that y'all are partnering with the STEM Library Lab, I think that is a, a resource to community organizations and allow them to have access to it as well. It's a beautiful space, and I can't it wait really to is. see what y'all uh, do there. It's back to Opelousas we go. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Last year, we had two charter organizations voluntarily make, make the decision to close schools with low enrollment. As a result of this change, other schools across the city are now enrolling a few more students, and hundreds of students were able to be moved to higher quality facilities. However, there are still challenges and areas of improvement for the process that enable schools to make this tough decision to voluntarily close, consolidate, or relocate. So these are some of the challenges that we are looking at and looking at developing policy around. Number one, timeline. Um, we need to know about voluntary actions as soon as possible, um, as early as possible to be able to support families and offer support to our charters to support schools um, with their challenges if they do decide to take any voluntary action. Um, the community engage communications and engagement piece, it's important that we have coordinated communication across all stakeholders for schools going through these, these different transitions and the siting process. Um, we run a very transparent siting process, but sometimes these decisions um, may need to be made quickly um, and plans need to be put in place. So we are looking at the possibility of um, giving the students occur. And so we want to make sure we ma maximize the funding that, that is impacting our scholars directly. And even taking a closer look at what we've defined as the school transformation fund and maybe even broaden that so we can incentivize some of these voluntary actions that in turn support the overall big picture of what's happening in our district. And one of the big, big another big concern for our charter, charter schools are what happens with accountability and contracts and things of that nature. So we don't want to penalize charters that are volunteer, volunteering to help with district optimization, but once again, another way to incentivize those voluntary actions and make sure that they receive all the supports that they possibly can receive. Today, I just plan to share uh, some draft language from the beginning of the policy, and also, a, we also bring in a policy during the policy and we, a first reading of the bulk of the policy no later than December. So schools and networks these tough decisions. We've already scheduled some additional office office hours for feedback, office hours for revisions, and collaboration. The next few slides really just talk is just goes over some of the draft introductory language. Um, right now, this particular policy, tentatively called district optimization, 
has a sunset date. And the thought about including the sun sunset date was just a priority when it comes to, to and funding and supporting schools in this increase innovative collaboration or partnerships across the schools. Examples to district optimization by meeting one or more of the criteria profit organizations and school basis whether a school transition contributes to district out for the big picture of our district when it comes to district optimization and throughout this as the superintendent shall provide regular updates to the board on district school transitions provide data related to reference and later on in the policy section the following for the upcoming year Update our RFA process. One to application, but we did receive um, th this uh, after we talked to them. They did not turn the application by the well their letter of intent, and so at this the um, so the timeline is, is basically moot. Um, there is a fee associated with it is a tantamount to about ninety seven hundred ninety seven hundred dollars. And that concludes the accountability update. And are there any questions? With the low enrollment possibly be impacted with volunteer, vol volunteering to close or having to suggest that they a specific we look, we see. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, there are a lot of technical issues and obstacles um, that are, you know, going to take a lot of. Um, careful thought and I know that you guys have been thinking a lot about it how do you early next month more school um, school leader office hours also we'll have time to work on the policy and we've scheduled revision hours as well um, and partnering with um, with um, Louisiana Association of Public Charter Schools and SNO policy experts and steps is, um, throughout the process okay so um, it sounds like your engagement is holding like Office hours. Do you have any that have gone through closure? I think that's all my questions. Thank you. Okay, anyone else, Mr. Ash? Thank you. I uh, I have a I have a more simpler question. Um, can, can you define what you mean by district, or what we may mean by district optimization? What What does that look like if we're successful? Like, what it, What is this? If it's successful then we will have, um, we'll have less unfilled seats and all at the or in quality facilities and the education. And we're maximizing our resources. Great, and is there a prioritization of those things? First part, which is making sure our kids are in quality environments, their experience and outcomes are improved by our decisions, right? And so is there a prioritization on how we're going to get that, or is the closing of things in schools the way in which we're going to get optimization? I just want to make sure I understand. The priority is quality schools. Um, aside from something separate from this, um, I think or not, but our solution is about quality schools and what they should look like. So that's one of one of the things. So this is is okay. We're gonna we're gonna spend more time with this with one another. I think you are attempting to articulate more difficult than it is spent time together, um, and I'm I'm sure my colleagues may see the plan in terms of the work that needs to be done around the seat allocation issue, right? Uh, you know, we have too many seats uh, for not enough children that's currently existing in our district. That's one issue. Then we have 
better outcomes for young people, experiences, uh, and environments. Housing an increase in child, uh, an increase in rents, and, and as you alluded to, uh, Mr. Sanders, the decrease in birth rates starting around 2017, which is now working through our system. So this is a percent over the last year, um, which is insane, and uh, speaks to the fact that we, uh, our city council, our mayor's office, our uh, legislative delegation, we affordable city, so that we limit uh, the kind of uh, <laughs> drain of students that we're seeing. So that's the framing um, for these questions. I think I would like to see, and I'm sure some of my colleagues would like to see in the next couple of months, uh, a better understanding of how many students we expect to have uh, over the course of the next few years. I don't remember if that was covered in the demographic presentation. It was presented in February. But what number of, ex of students are we expecting to see? And what is the corresponding number of seats that we should have based on that number. Um, I also, I don't remember if it was in your proposed policy changes or not, but I also just have questions about how enrollment targets are set um, moving forward. Uh, in this world where we are trying to optimize the number of seats, you know, are schools able to, uh, you know, set very ambitious enrollment targets that may, uh, be good for them, but bad for the system. I don't know the answer to that. So when we sit together, I would, I would love to hear more about that. Um, and then lastly, I think this is farther down the road, but this is something that's important to every member of this board is eventually I would love to hear an update on the community engagement strategy um, because you know people will see a headline about district optimization and they may think, you know, my school's getting close tomorrow. That's obviously not the case. That's something that uh, we and Dr. Williams, I know you place a special emphasis on this. So what, you know, moving forward, I would also love for the board to hear what the community engagement strategy will be around some of these school planning decisions. Yes, sir. I'll make sure I um, get all those answers covered. Mr. Marshall. You know that we, we have a, a great system for allowing the educators closest to the, the students to serve them best, right? To be able to make those decisions that impact them. And this is what the system is, is built on, right? Giving them the autonomy to, to do the work closest to the students. Beautiful in concept, but it creates so many problems that optimization is going to have to deal with. For an example of, of the kind of complexity this involves, we're losing students, we're not losing students, but we don't have as many students entering the system as the system was built for. So that's why we have seats that aren't being occupied, which puts some schools in jeopardy because they may not have enough funding to maintain the level of expertise that they're dev devoting to their students. That's the problem we, we have with the numbers. But the system presents a problem where you can have a great school doing excellent work, but not have the number of students that it needs to continue to do that work because of its location and because of the building that it's in. It's not an attractive location or building where we can have a, a great building with, a, with an, uh, an organization that's not doing stellar work that we need to, to change. So the complexity of this is what do you do with that, right? They have enough students over here, but it may be an, a DNF school. Over here, it's a A or B school, or at least a, a C school, and doesn't have the numbers. This is an extremely complex system that we have, and we have just begun to deal with some of the issues that it presents. Optimization would be that we have the, the best school, school facility, excuse me, we have the school facilities that are what we want for our children filled to capacity with excellent programming, right? Right. But it, it is going to require us working diligently with the school leaders, 
with the communities to open and close schools that best serve these students. And it's not gonna be an easy fix. It's not gonna be something that we can explain on our feet, but it's, it is something that we're gonna all have to work together to, to logically figure out how do we serve our kids in the best buildings with the best programming. It's not gonna be easy, but it's something that we all have to put our hats on and work together to solve. Thank you. Mr. Ashley. Yeah, I just wanna build on, on Mr. Marshall's point. This idea around creating the right portfolio of schools for our district and, and making sure the right instruction that exists for the kids that are in our system, it may have, it may be um, in direct challenge to the idea of closing schools that may not meet seat optimization. They may not have all the kids there, but their programming is right for our system and the kids that are in our system. You know, we have several schools, I think, that don't, that, that meet this challenge, but it is a need for our system to be able to make sure this, this exists. And, you know, I think about our all boys school, high school, which is a, you know, phenomenal um, program for young people, particularly boys of color. And, and we got to make sure that I think they're, they're headed in the right direction around trends of enrollment. But if we were having this conversation a year ago, I don't know if they open. And, and for someone like myself, definitely you, right, as black men, this is a good place for boys and boys of color. And so this idea around district optimization and like that's why I was getting to the question around prioritization. It's like what are we prioritizing as important understanding our system and like you know i hear all the challenges that exist within you know our current community context of instability but like we can't we can't optimi optimize our district without equity in mind and setting aside that uh, and you know perpetuating some form of racism by, by the result of our actions saying like, well, you know, it makes a lot of sense financially for us to do this, you know? Sure, thank you. Thank you. I, I think uh, just um, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Ashley, I think those are excellent points. This is, this is a mathematical problem. It is a moral problem. It is a philosophical problem. And, you know, it's a long journey that we're gonna go on together. And we need to make certain to keep all of those things in mind. Definitely. Serve God. Yeah, I appreciate that we're having this conversation. Um, we're ending up having a very wide ranging conversation about um, the entire challenge, which then we could include, for example, we need to maintain a diversity of a large number of operators. It makes no sense to consolidate like the entire district under four operators or something like that because they're deemed successful under state, you know, guidelines. Um, but to recenter us today, we're talking about voluntary surrender, that's the only policy that's under consideration at this moment. As you all continue to, in your good conversations with school leaders who've been through this, develop all these next steps that are gonna be difficult for us, um, which we have hired an extraordinary superintendent to lead us through, but it's gonna be a difficult time for districts around the country. Um, so just remember, everyone, we're, we're just beginning this process, and everyone understand I believe you're hearing that we're considering every single aspect as to preserve what's working with what we're doing and, uh, and, and, and keep it strong, equitable, uh, thriving. Uh, anyway, just thought I'd point that out. Thank you all. Okay, great feedback. Yes, excellent. That's it. Dr. Batista. Thank you, Ms. Eames, and uh, to Mr. Simmons. I want to commend you for the level of work that you're undertaking, and I listened very attentively as you were explaining what this action will entail, what this, the uh, community circles are going to be for input and the like, and I can also hear the trepidation, if you will, in the voices of some of my colleagues, as well as the opportunistic moment that is before us. I think that with all of these things in the right measure and the right mixture, we're in the right vein because right now we have schools that are 
doing very well within our district. We have schools that are at their capacity, but we have schools too on the other end where they're not at capacity. And so I think it's just really the best thing that we as a board, who are the financial stewards of the collective revenues for the district, for the children, that we're doing the right thing. And I think that with the quality circles that you're gonna have with community involvement, we just have to be there as board members and listen to what the community members have to say to us. And when we get back together as a board, sit and unpack those things, because it's gonna be our working together on their behalf. Because they have elected us, or those of you who've been elected, they've elected you to serve in their stead, to represent them. So I think we're going down a road and we're not having any surprises. And I wanna commend my colleagues here on the board because you've had some great discussion here that right here for today. And I know that this will only grow as time gets closer and when the moment is actually ripe for this action to take place. So I wanna commend all of you, the administration and the board members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Now President Parker will facilitate the Committee of the Whole. All right, wonderful, thank you so much. We're now moving on, uh, thank you to Dr. Jordan and Mr. Simmons, and Ms. Eames. Um, we're now moving on to item 4.1, uh, which is a presentation on redistricting. And so I will recognize Ms. Courtney Washington and Mr. Christopher Etienne uh, for an update on that redistricting process. How you doing, board members, board president, superintendent, and uh, community? My name is Christopher Etienne. I'm the director of community and government affairs with NOLA PS, and this is my colleague, Courtney Washington. She's the chief communications and uh, community affairs officer, and we'll be presenting part two of the redistricting process with uh, Rebecca and Kate from Flow Analytics. Can you all hear us? <laughs> yes, we can. Good afternoon. All right, well, I'm gonna share my screen in one second. And all right. All right, well, it is a pleasure to be with you all today. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here again and to be able to present the draft maps that we have been working with the district to develop. So just to kind of provide a reminder of where, who we are and where we've been and what this process is. So again, my name is Rebecca Wright. I am with Flow Analytics and I am joined here by my colleague, Kate Duran, who is also with Flow Analytics. We have a wonderful subcontractor who we are working with locally, and they're the Hawthorne Agency. Um, and so we have a team of demographers and data analysts who are working on this project. And then we also have the Hawthorne Agency, which is a local, as I mentioned, a local public relations firm that are in based out of New Orleans. And they also have a wonderful team of staff who has been working on developing the community outreach and engagement plan for this project. So just to provide you a reminder about what this actually is and what we're here to do. So every 10 years, the census releases its data and requires that school districts be redrawn so that each district is reasonably equal in population. Again, that is to the goal is to really ensure that there is equal representation across the district and that each board member represents about the same number of constituents. So those are the project goals. In terms of the process and the timeline for this work, so we've already had our first public hearing on this, and that's when we presented just what, what the process looks like, and we talked about what the current statistics are showing, what the current um, board member boundaries look like, and what the number of um, individuals are within each of those districts. Today is the public hearing two, where we are going to be discussing and presenting our draft maps. And as Kate will go through those, the reminder is that these are the launching points for conversation, the starting points. So, uh, and Kate will describe more in detail what those are and what those represent 
Uh, and then we will have a third public hearing in December to actually discuss, uh, present like revised draft maps. So between this public hearing and the third one, we are going to be taking public feedback that we receive and feedback from the board and incorporating that feedback into a series of revised draft maps that we will be presenting. We will also be having our first round of community meetings in November, and they will have um, one meeting per district. And those will be hybrid meetings, both in person and online. Um, so be on the lookout for communications about when those dates, times, and locations will be. Then after the third public hearing, we'll have a second round of community meetings, one in each of the seven districts in January of 2023. Again, those will be hybrid meetings. People will be able to in, uh, tune into those either in person or online. And then there will be a deadline for public comments at the beginning of February, and we will have the fourth public hearing in February to present the final map option or options to the board for consideration. So in terms of outreach and engagement, we have been working with the district very closely and our subcontractors, the Hawthorne Agency, to create a community engagement strategy that includes those public meetings that I mentioned. We also have a redistricting engagement portal where folks can go to find all of this information about the process, about the, the to access the draft maps, and to be able to submit feedback on the process and the maps themselves. As I mentioned, we will have four public hearings, the two rounds of specific community outreach meetings. And again, we really want to emphasize that public feedback is a really crucial part of this process. We really need that feedback in order to guide where those boundaries are drawn for each district. And so as part of that, one of the things that we really ask for folks to let us know is where their communities are, where those boundaries should be drawn in order to effectively preserve their communities. You all know your areas, you know where your neighborhoods, you know where uh, major roads are, where we can actually see major roads, but we may not necessarily know that that should be a dividing line between one neighborhood and another. So we really need your input, we need your feedback in this process. And so uh, Kate's gonna talk about the process for for um, the maps and how you can provide feedback. But again, that's really, really crucial. And it's we rely on it in order to draw these boundaries. So Kate's gonna now talk through the draft maps that we've created based on the feedback we've already received. Um, and so we look forward to getting more feedback throughout this process. And again, we need you to tell us where these pieces are. So make sure that you let us know um, you can do that online through the redistricting engagement portal, and you can also submit your feedback by going to the community meetings that are being held in each of your districts. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kate to talk about the draft months. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. So I will get into a little bit of the analysis here first. Um, it'll be a recap of what we talked about at the last public hearing. So to make these draft maps, we are following a set of criteria. So the districts must be population balanced, which means less than 10% difference between the populations of any two districts. The districts must be contiguous areas. And if they cross something like the Mississippi River, um, you have to include either the bridge or the ferry line that connects those two pieces together. They have to be done in compliance with state and local and federal laws, of course. Um, we can't be re redistricting to favor or disfavor a protected class or political party. And then what we try to do is make these areas as compact as possible so that they really look like an area. They're not, you know, kind of reaching out. Um, we're preserving communities of mutual interest as much as possible, um, including neighborhoods and these should be preserving the uh, existing natural boundaries, like major roads, bodies of water, parks, things like that. So if you are a visual person, this is kind of what some of these look like. So contiguity, have to keep the whole area together, can't split it into two pieces. Compactness, this is a good little visual for we don't want these kind of thin or reaching uh, areas. What we really want is the area to look like 
a district <laughs> and not like a, you know, kind of stretched out and then following these natural boundaries where, where possible and where it makes sense. And there might be some things that take precedent over others. Uh, population might, population balance might take precedence over uh, compactness um, and a neighborhood might take a precedence over a natural boundary. So that's where this community process comes into play. This is what the current districts look like. And we did talk to all of the board members, kind of talked with them through this process before the last public hearing um, and got some ideas from them for where we could start with, with these draft maps. Um, and so the process will have two rounds of draft maps before we even get to a final map. So that's what's really nice about this process is these community meetings um, that will be coming up in November will allow people to give us feedback on these draft maps. Um, so we're not starting from this point with the community feedback. We're starting from these draft maps that are balanced and give you an idea of what these maps could look like. And then we kind of go from there. So to balance the population, this is really the biggest piece. Uh, we're definitely looking for, if you see us uh, talk about um, the ideal population, which is the average of all of the, you know, people in each of the seven districts. Um, and the sum of the, the differences between the highest level, say one was over by 2,000 people and one was under by 2,000 people, what is the percent difference between those two? And if it's under 10%, that's really what we're looking for. Um, we try to plan for 5% or under in our draft maps, knowing that we might need to make some changes there. But that allows for the populations to grow and change over the next 10 years and hopefully still not be over that 10% difference. So the closer you can get to zero, the better. Um, but we know there's a lot of factors coming in here. So when we look at the 2010, uh, the districts with the 2010 population, the districts were totally in compliance. 7.3% uh, difference between the highest and lowest districts, which were three and four at the time. But since populations have changed and we have a new census, now the difference between these districts, um, you can see that population over or under the ideal, the average, has really changed between 2010 and 2020. And now our biggest difference is 19.2. So that's the number that we're working on getting lower and trying to get those populations over and under closer to zero, <laughs> you know, closer to two, closer to zero. Um, let's bring it back down so that it looks closer to what we had in 2010. So the draft maps, we started with the current boundaries. We're not trying to change too much, but we do need to, um, you know, make some changes to bring that population back into balance. Um, so these draft maps meet all of these criteria. Neither of the maps are expected to become the final map. We know that there's going to be a lot of changes uh, between now and where we end up at the final. Um, so they're open for consideration. We just like to provide you with a, a valid starting point or two starting points um, so that you're looking at something that is... Uh, balanced and meets all of the criteria. And then we can tweak those from there. So the final map, which we will finish up, I believe in February, the final map incorporates all of the board input, the public input, elements of the draft maps. It's a result of a lot of discussion and it will also follow all of these criteria, but it will reflect in a way public sentiment, but Potentially, we you know we won't be able to do everything with this final map. So we are taking this into account, but we do have to look at those criteria as well. So it ends up being a compromise between the requirements and the input. So the two draft maps I'm about to present, um, they're fairly similar in a few ways because we, you know, don't either don't know too much about the area that we were making a change in, or we think that that change really aligns with, you know, what we need in that area. And we're hoping that uh, we got a couple of these areas close. So draft map one has that 6.3% difference between the, uh, between two districts. And so that's a lot lower than 19.2, which is great. This consolidates District 4 in the West Bank. So that's really the biggest change in both of these maps is taking District 7 out of the West Bank and having that all be District 4, which was a comment we heard a lot. Um, 
and we connect it over to the French Quarter via the ferry line. So there has to be that con contiguity between District 4 and the West Bank, and there aren't enough people in the West Bank to just make that District 4. So we do have to go across the river, unfortunately, and, and you know, kind of pull in some more population there. So District 7, as you can imagine, is, is you know, in this draft map is losing population on the other side of the river, so has to gain it from somewhere in the city. So you're seeing District 7 kind of expanding outwards in response to losing that population. And then most of the other adjustments are made for compactness reasons, small, you know, population balance um, and aligning with voting precincts, which you'll see is a big, um, you know, it's a big thing that we dealt with when we were doing redistricting with the city, which is we have to follow the voting precincts and the voting precincts don't follow the neighborhoods <laughs> at all times. Um, so you might be looking at something like uh, Bywater and thinking, wow, that looks really weird. Like, why can't we just include all of Bywater in one place? Um, and it's typically because we are following voting precincts lines. So that's just something that you might see. Graph map two, similar to map one in a lot of places, um, and we'll show you the similarities. There's only one precinct that's moved to District 4 in the front, and that's really to keep that contiguity. Um, and then the central business district in draft map two stays in district seven, map one, it goes to district five for population balance. So those are areas where you'll see, you know, with this is where we'll be getting feedback is, do we like, you know, keeping this in seven? Is it fine to move it to five? This is where we want to have that conversation. Draft map two is a lower, um, percent deviation. So it's 3.1%. So it's closer to zero. Both maps are good, um, but it is less compact than draft map one. So you've got some trade-offs there. Okay, go ahead. So a couple of change areas. Um, District one needs a very small change um, to make it kind of a, almost an ideal population. It's minus 77 people. So this one area um, in East New Orleans that is already bordering to District 2, if we extend that out to I-10, um, north of I-10 up to Morrison Road, and if that goes into District 2, that's the only change we need to make in that whole area. Um, and so this is an example of what we need to do to bring District 1 down a little bit because we do need to move some population out to balance it. This might be a great place to look at. This might not be a great place to look at. Is there another place we could move, you know, people into District 2 that would be better? So that's the kind of conversation we want to have in that area. And this is the same in both maps, just, you know, an example of an area we could move, but we do have to move something in that area into District 2. Uses an existing neighborhood, follows precinct boundaries, and it's compact. It just kind of rounds out that, that area that's already in District 2. Similar to, and I'm sorry, that was on the right side of the screen. So on the left side of the screen, similar area, um, the Milnberg area. So you have the Elysian Fields area um, currently uh, in District 3. So the black line there is the current edge of District 3. And if we take it straight down the middle of the road and have District 2 on one side, District 3 on another side, it actually balances the neighborhoods, follows the neighborhoods better, balances District 3 really well. Um, and it's easier for folks in that area to understand. So, you know, if you're on this side of the road, you're in two. If you're on this side, you're in three. That's an, an option in that area to uh, help out with District 3 population. So that's the same in both maps as well. All right. And then this is uh, a couple of areas that are the same in both maps because of that West Bank move. So you can see, again, sorry, I'm starting on the right <laughs> because it kind of explains the left. The West Bank area there that's got the black outline, that's currently in District 7. So the, the request to try out would, was to move that into District 4. So every uh, person in, West, in the West Bank neighborhood area would be in District 4. Um, and so that results in needing to move more people into District 7. So then you've got this area of Bywater, St. Rock, St. Claude going into District 7 to balance that out. 
Um, so you, cause you got to add some people in somewhere, they go really low <laughs> when you take them out of district, uh, out of the West Bank area. So that balances district two's population, follows precincts, neighborhoods. You can see that kind of step shape. Those are the voting precincts. So we can't just cut it straight across Claiborne um, because it's part of a voting precinct that's on the other side of Claiborne. So some of this has to follow precincts, but we're trying to keep it you know, as compact as possible. So those are areas that are the same in both maps, trying to balance them out. All right, so if we just talk about draft map one, uh, you can see those kind of two red squares at the top there is what we just talked about. So that East New Orleans area, that Millenberg area, you can see the, by, the square around the Bywater there and the square around the West Bank. We kind of went through those four already. Um, and you will be able to view these maps, and zoom in on them and everything. They're already up on the uh, engagement portal. So if you want to download them yourself and check them out, they're already posted. So we've got a 6.3% population overall deviation. And the highest percent is uh, District 4 is a little high because we actually kind of round out in the French Quarter to make it a little more compact. And then District 7 is a little low, but still at 6.3%, which is good. And then we do include, and we've got more stats as well, posted on the portal, but this is the total population by race and ethnicity. And what we're really checking for is that four out of the seven districts are majority black districts. Um, that's something that we're, you know, just making sure that that's, that's currently the case. It matches with the population um, per the 2020 census. And then that's something that we are making sure is still in balance while we're doing this process. All right, so this is draft map one uh, on its own. And draft map two has a different configuration for this area. So the for draft map one, you've got these this kind of back and forth between D3 and D7. Those are precinct boundaries. And so we're just kind of correcting for or adjusting for precinct boundaries in that area. You could go either way. Um, and so if people have opinions in that uh, neighborhood about which should go where, uh, you know, that's something that we can definitely talk about, work on, but we have to follow the precinct boundaries. Connecting to the West Bank along the ferry line so that D4 is contiguous, you've got this kind of the black dash line, that's where the ferry is. And so you have to connect uh, either side of Canal Street, but it makes sense to grab with uh, grab the French Quarter side. You could round out the French Quarter like that so that it's more compact and includes the whole, you know, neighborhood, but, um, and and I believe it, it goes up into a, a neighborhood outside of the French Quarter as well, but that kind of rounds it out. That's based on what the voting precincts look like in that area. So we don't have to include that much of the French Quarter in District 4, but we're doing it in this map to show you what it could look like. And District 4 is more compact in this map. And then as a result of where District 7 has picked up from, we move the um, central business district to district five. So you can see that yellowy orange area at the bottom that helps to balance the population. So it's under 10%. And then district seven is more compact kind of north of North Claiborne. Um, and that is district uh, draft map one kind of French quarter central business, business district area. And then if you go to the next slide, this is the um, kind of the balance between District 5 and District 6. And you can see that's uh, uh, Jefferson Avenue, I believe, running right up in, in between. So a lot of these moves are to kind of make this a little more compact. It balances the population between the two. Um, and it actually adds Booker T. Washington High School, I believe, where the uh, red arrow is on the right, into District 5, which was something that was talked about as a consideration. So that's what this would look like between six and five, and it might be a little easier to um, you know, know which district you're in. You're either on one side of Jefferson or the other, that might be more helpful. Um, but you know, we definitely know there's different neighborhoods, um, Broadmoor in this area. So you know, in, to the extent that neighborhoods might need to be kept together, there's some play we could do in this area as well. All right, draft map two. 
So you can see again, the top two red squares on the inset map we talked about already. That's the East New Orleans and uh, Milnberg area. We've already talked about West Bank. So again, we're gonna come into the middle of the city, the French Quarter uh, Central Business District area and that area between six and five. So we've got a 3.1% um, deviation on this one. You can see how low those deviations from the ideal are. Um, so that's, you know, we've got a lot lower. It's really between two and four. Um, and all of these numbers are, are low enough that this is a great uh, starting option. <clears throat> and again, same thing with draft map two. We're just kind of keeping track of making sure that we don't um, remove a majority uh, black district from any of these uh, from any of these districts per how it is currently. So we just double check that information. All right, so last map slide. This is the uh, French Quarter you can tell is very different from uh, draft map one. So it's not including that whole area, French, uh, French Quarter and, uh, and upper, you know, kind of neighborhoods from there. We've got this one long skinny area, which we need to connect the ferry over to district four on the other side of the river. That is because of a precinct. So that's what that precinct looks like. Um, it's, you know, so it ends up looking a little bit weird. This is not gerrymandering if you have to include a whole precinct, you know. So this this kind of thing is like you can have weird shapes and they can definitely be explained. So you could either, you know, have draft map one where you're including that whole area or this one where you've got kind of a smaller area. Um, we've got the same issue or not issue, but the same deal going on with district three and seven, just, you know, adjusting along precincts. This one keeps the central business district area in district seven. We've got an arrow in the middle. The only place that it's contiguous with that, that area. And again, precinct boundaries, <laughs> this is why is at that one little block. So it's technically contiguous, but it does look a little wonky to kind of come around there. But we did want to show what this would look like if you kept that in District 7, given that precinct that needs to go to 4. And then we've got this uh, part of 7 going into District 6 um, over on the left-hand side into the pink area. And then this last one is fairly similar to draft map 1. So we've kind of, you know, put out there that you could clean up this boundary um, along a major road and maybe have it be a little more understandable. You could keep more of Broadmoor together in this map, um, but there's a lot that you can do between six and five. So if folks have opinions about this area and the best way it could be balanced, um, this is what we're looking for. So, All right, that's all the maps. Um, where can I find the maps and data? So I'm gonna share my screen if I can. Um, I think you have to stop sharing. Yeah. So here is the redistricting engagement portal. The link is in this presentation. This presentation's in the agenda for the meeting. Um, and so, and you can also e email Christopher at any time and get access to this website. So what we have done was added this section here. This is new as of this morning, draft maps round one. So we've got the draft map PDF link, which takes you to a full map with all of the changes in it. So we kind of stepped through them, but they're all in this one uh, link here. We have the summary statistics PDF, which shows you more information about citizen voting age populations. Um, and you can see all of the details there. And then we also updated the district scenario modeler tool. So if you've gone into the tool before, the tool now operates based on precincts so that it's easier to make changes. And we've got, you know, this is draft map one in the tool. So you don't have to try to get to this point. You can start from this point and uh, zoom in and make changes to the map and say, well, I wanna take this and remove it from district five and I wanna add it to district seven. And then this will update and tell you if that works or not. Um, so you can really come in here now and start to play with these draft maps and come up with some other options. And if you really like the option that you come up with and you want us to see it, 
uh, you can go in, the instructions are here, but you can uh, click on the map and then go to download the data. And then you're able to download a file that you can then submit to us. And we'll be able to use that in our considerations as well. So that's all just coming back here, all on the redistricting engagement portal website. And the link is in the presentation that um, Rebecca will show in a moment. All right, I'm out. Thanks, Kate. All right, I'm gonna reshare my screen. All right. Okay, so as Kate mentioned, here is the link to the redistricting engagement portal. We really want your feedback. Please take some time, go in there. If you have ideas, draw maps and comments in. You can also reach us via phone or there's also an email address you can reach us through that goes to Christopher and he can either respond or forward them to us for response. So we would love your feedback and comments. And with that, we are done with our presentation and we're happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much to our partners at Flow. Um, Ms. Washington, Mr. Etienne, do you have anything to add before I open it up to board members? All right, wonderful. Board members, do you have any questions uh, either for our district staff here or for Flow Analytics? One question. Uh, is it at all possible to overlay on this map where schools are, where schools are located? So that when we redraw... Yeah, I can answer that question. I think I, I think I heard that correctly. So to show where the schools are on that uh, tool, yes. I can add those in. I believe we have the locations and I could add those into the map. You would kind of see them underneath the uh, the precincts, but they would be, you know, they'd be visible through, but they wouldn't be sitting on top of them because you need to click on the precincts uh, in the tool itself. But we can definitely add those in as as locations. That you'd so be able so to if see. we expanded it, you know, we would see the precinct and we could see a, a school designation or something when we click on a precinct, if it's in that particular precinct? The, the, the I'm not sure if I heard, if that was a question, I didn't hear the yeah, question. So it's, I it's a, the question is when you, you said the, the precinct would be on top, right? So if you click on the precinct, would it show what school was in that precinct? Would it show which school is in that particular precinct? It yes. wouldn't label it it would just give you a location you know that you could see the school but i can it, it, i can see how much information we can get in there for that school okay i mean i think it's imp it's important for say for instance if you have a school that has two buildings you know you wouldn't want one building in one one district and one building in the other district if it just means you know moving the line to the left or right and stay within that population so you'd keep a school together in a particular board member's district. That's why, the, I'm just telling you, that's why the information is important. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Board I'm not sure if that was a question. We might need that relayed to us. We're just okay. having to listen. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a call. I'll give you a call. Quite clearly. Yeah. It's our, and call, board members, it seems like there might be a little bit of a delay between when we're speaking and when they're able to answer. Um, other questions from board members? This will come as no surprise. I have a, f a number of them. Um, my first question, uh, and I don't know if this is for our district staff or this is for Flow Analytics, but uh, I've heard multiple mentions of the Hawthorne Agency and the community engagement that is going to be done, but we have yet to hear from them uh, and hear anything <laughs> about what that community engagement will look like. I have no doubt that they're good at their jobs, but I would love a, an update before our next board meeting about what that plan is for community engagement. It's something that we value as a board uh, and have valued since we were elected to office, and I want to make sure that the community engagement for this process meets the standard that we've set uh, for our superintendent search and our uh, facilities renaming and all of that. Um, I also, this is for our, our friends at Flow. Um, I would love, I know when we spoke, I talked about uh, sharing districts, uh, school board districts overlapping with state legislators, um, because I think when elected officials share constituents, that opens up opportunities for collaboration. And so if it's possible to get uh, an understanding of 
which other elected officials these districts overlap with. I think that would be helpful. Um, yeah, I think I caught that. So we did check to make sure that each of these districts in the draft maps has, I believe we checked to make sure there's two elected officials in each of these new district lines. So no one's covered just by one area. So that was something that we did check while we were developing these and that we can continue to check as we're as we're updating these uh, draft maps going forward. Great, thank you. I would I would love to see like district one overlaps with this, these city council members, these state representatives, and these state senators, because I know that the state legislative maps changed recently as well. Um, and again, I just think this is it's a way to increase collaboration across uh, elected bodies. Um, I would also love to see a breakdown again uh, from Flow Analytics about I was able to piece this together from your presentations, but the racial breakdowns of the district in 2010 and the racial breakdowns of the new maps side by side um, so that we don't have to go back and forth between presentations to see what the changes would be. Um, I think that would be particularly helpful. Um, the question about the West Bank s splitting between two representatives or consolidating with one I don't know whether or not that would de I, I, I want to make sure that, that we don't decrease the voice of our constituents on the West Bank. And so I'm just going to kind of as a plea to the community, especially the West Bank community, to please get involved in this process and voice whether or not that is something you want, where all districts are consolidated, all West Bank precincts are consolidated into one district, or whether you prefer the, the status quo of, of two districts on the West Bank. Um, and the last two questions I have, I think, or I guess it's just one question because you answered one of them is, is the, um, is the URL that you shared available on the district website now? Uh, and is it, is it, I know when we did the renaming and the superintendent search, it was on a banner. It's a banner. We uh, currently, we were just uh, discussing that. It is under community as redistricting and we do have it at the footer of the website, but today we're going to get it moved to the yeah. homepage right bef above renaming so that the information is easier um, for our community stakeholders. That'd be too. great. Thank you. And and I think if there's a way to get like a, a shortened URL for the, for the tool, okay. um, that would be helpful as well because right now it's, you know, quite extensive. Will do. Um, okay. I think that concludes my comments and questions. Anything else, board members? All right. Seeing none, um, thank you, Flow Analytics. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Thank you, Mr. Etienne. Uh, we are now going to welcome Committee Chair Bodwin to take us through the policy section. It is a long one today. Um, yeah. So everybody buckle up. Thank you. OK. Welcome to the policy committee meeting. Um, we have Laz. President Parker mentioned we have a lot on the agenda. Um, we're going to start with 5.1, which is a notice of intent to amend policy HA school board chartering authority. Um, this is to provide notice of intent to pre present a revision to policy HA with respect to the required grade levels for which any charter operator that transports children on school buses must provide transportation. Uh, do we have any public comment? Uh, no, Ms. Bowden, there was one comment card that was submitted for this item, but I understand that that's been withdrawn and there are no other uh, comment cards related to the policy agenda. Okay, thank you. Will you highlight, if something comes in, will you just stop me? Yes. Okay, so there are no public comment cards for the rest of the, just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Um, any um, board comment on this? Ms. Seams? Well, we're excited for this particular policy because it was an inconvenience to parents and grandparents that uh, children were having to catch public service buses when the school bus was picking up right at the home. So thank you, board members. Any other comment? Okay, thank you. Um, we don't have, do we take action on this notice of intent? No. Okay, moving on to 5.2. An amendment to policy HB, oversight and evaluation of charter schools. If a school intends to surrender its charter at the end of a school year, it is important that it is announced early enough in the school year to give families and staff adequate time to make transition plans. 
This policy change was shift the deadline for a charter operator to notify the OPSB of its decision to relinquish from December 31st to December 1st. We'll also ensure that notifications will be made early in the NOLA PS common application process. Any board comment? Okay, seeing none, um, may I have a motion to move this forward to the full board? Oh, sorry. This is this is just a first read. Oh, sorry, duh. Right. For the the um, these are all numerous uh, yeah. items on yeah. today's agenda. We're not moving. Um, everything from five point two to I think we have five point three one. Those are all just a first okay. read today. Thank you. Right. So we don't and, take action on them. Yeah. And Ms. Moss. <clears throat> the remaining policies. Um, primarily consist of those that have been revised to bring them um, into um, into agreement with recent legislative changes. And then there are others um, that reflect changes from the 2021 legislative session, I think it's about 13 of them, that were carried over just because of competing um, demands last year. So those have been carried over. About 20 of them are from the 2022 legislative session. Um, and if it's okay with you, um, Ms. Baldwin, the way I would like to handle this is to identify which of those update, updates resulted in uh, recommendations for new policy as well as to call out two scenarios in which administrative recommendations have been incorporated into the changes. So based on changes that were made in the 2022 legislature, there are three new policies that are being proposed. The first is 5.18 and that relates to cameras in special education classrooms. Um, that policy is required by law. Last year in 2021, the legislature implemented um, this change. However, um, it, it was essentially held off because it was reliant on um, the provision of funding to carry it out. So this year, the legislature came back and um, what they did was establish a deadline by which we now have to adopt policy in this regard. At the same time, funding was identified um, in order to accomplish this. So the deadline that was set forth for the policy is December 31st, 2022. So we'll be in compliance with that deadline if the board um, moves it forward for adoption uh, after the first and second reading. What that entails is stated in the rationale statement. It's basically a requirement for school boards to provide for installation and operation of cameras for video and audio recording in the classroom um, that's deemed to be um, a SPED classroom pursuant to the statute upon the request of a parent or guardian. And then there are further mandates embedded in the law that require us to implement certain administrative procedures around things like how requests are to be made, retention, storage, who can access, things like that. Um, I just wanna share with you that this policy um, is gonna be part of discussions that our SPED team is planning for our schools, I think November 1st. Uh, we have in place now some procedures that are compliant with what's required by the statute. And so what our team is gonna be doing is sharing some model procedures with our schools that they can consider 
uh, utilizing themselves. Certainly, they have the ability to design their own process that's compliant with the law, but our SPED team tries to oftentimes to provide them with model processes that they can implement. So I just wanted to share with you all that that's going to be forthcoming. Uh, the other new policy, the second new policy is uh, student voter registration, which is 5.33, and that simply requires schools to make um, school resources available um, for students to register to vote, um, and it also provides for um, it provides for co cooperation with outside organizations. However, those cannot be partisan or political organizations. So something that this board has seen fit to champion over the years has now become legislation. And the final new policy is 5.36, and that relates to patriotic organizations. Um, our legislature has seen fit to require schools in the state to make school facilities available for patriotic organizations who have youth groups to come into schools and to recruit student members. Um, so that's what that policy entails. It references Title 26 of the United States Code, which has a plethora of uh, patriotic organizations listed uh, that would be um, considered in this, but the ones that I guess are most notable and that we call out are Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Clubs, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, um, but certainly there are myriad other organizations in there um, that would benefit from a policy like this. With regard to those policies that contain administrative recommendations, the first is the mandatory vaccination policy. And we are recommending that the language that the board last added to the policy around boosters be deleted and that the policy now refers again to a requirement for full vaccination in accordance with the CDC definitions of full vaccinations. And that's a recommendation that's come from my medical consultants, you know, based on the latest trends, the latest guidance. The second relates to our bids and quotations policy. The legislative change in that policy was to increase, well, raise the bid thresholds for purchase of materials and supplies from a scenario in which materials and supplies purchases less than $10,000 could be made by direct purchase um, between 10 and 30 could be made by um, receiving quotes and then above that had to be competitively bid. Now they've shifted, the legislature have shifted those thresholds to scenario in which now between zero and $30,000 can be direct purchases. Between 30 and 60 would be quotations and then above that would be um, would be competitively bid. So that was the legislative change. What our administration has recommended, in addition to that as a change to the bids and quotations policy, is an increase in the bid threshold for professional services. Currently, professional services under $50,000 um, can be contracted without the necessity of public bid. The administration is recommending that that be increased from 50 to 75 to such that professional services below $75,000 would not have to be competitively 
bid. So I needed to call those out to you because those go beyond um, legislative updates or policy cleanup that's done periodically in conjunction with those legislative updates. Are there any questions from board members about any of those? Um, we're going to go through, e we have to go through each one um, just as a matter of course. So if there are any questions along the way, um, which I think mm -hmm. there will be for some, we'll call them out, I think, at the time. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, board counsel, is the, does the rationale have to be read too? Uh, no, I don't I mean, believe so. I mean, it, yeah. it is in the um, board docs and publicly posted um, agenda, so I would just say you can read the title of each item mm -hmm. and then ask for a board, you know, if there's any board comments or questions for Ms. Moss. Okay. Any objection to that, no. committee members? Okay. Great. That'll save us a lot of time. Thank you very much, Ms. Moss, for pointing those out. Um, and um, I think, I know I have some comments and questions on some of them. If anybody else does, I'm going to ask. Board at the end of I do have one yeah. kind of broad question for Ms. Moss before mm -hmm. we get started. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that anything, is it, am, am I correct in my understanding that anything from 5.3 on is directly related to the district and its internal policies and may not directly impact charter schools who may need to take their own? Board that's, action. That's that, correct. Okay. And not all of them are actually applicable to charter schools. <laughs> um, as you know, charter schools are generally not subject to the laws and regulations that govern school districts generally, um, with various exceptions. So it's dependent on whether or not charter schools have been um, incorporated into. Uh, a particular piece of reg le legislation. Got it. And, and have you or anyone on your team held conversations with our charter organizations to make sure that they are, or their council to make sure that they are up to date on the legisl legislative changes and what applies to them? Yeah, I don't, I don't engage directly okay. with schools. Got it. Um, so mm -hmm. that would not be my team. Uh, um, but I can tell you that Schools do receive their legislative updates from LAPCS. They put out a publication um, annually with regard to legislative updates that impact charter schools. And certainly, it's my understanding that anyone can access those. Great. They're publicly accessible. Thank you. And then the last question I have is, or is more of a statement. So because 5.3 on deals with district policy, mm -hmm. that is why these are going straight to first reading and not necessarily a notice of intent. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And Thank I you. should also add, with regard to changes that impact charter schools, if it's anything that um, will require changes to the requirements we have of schools, our checklist or anything like that, that we evaluate them against, then those are revised accordingly, administratively. Thank you, Mrs. Ervigon. Yeah, and, and to your point, President Parker, um, I think our school operators need to remember that when you're your own LEA, sometimes this is the kind of responsibility that then you take upon yourself mm -hmm. to be un to understand everything, be prepared, be in compliance. And so you're right; uh, everyone needs to check it and make sure that they are. Good point. Okay. Any more general questions or comments before we move on? Okay. So. Uh, we'll start with 5.3, which is an amendment to policy BE, school board ethics. Any comments from the committee? Questions? Seeing none, 5.4, amendment to policy DJE purchasing. Any comments? I, Mr. Parker. Yeah, um, I have a, a comment for both 5.4 and 5.5. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I would love to sit with district staff to learn more about um, our current purchasing policy, our current policy on bids and quotations, and just hear more about the rationale for these changes. Um, I'm not opposed to them. I just mm -hmm. would like to be fully informed. Um, and so if we could set up some time outside of a meeting, that would be great. 
Any and other on 5.4? 5, 5. 4. I have comments on 5.5 5 that may, um, to build on that. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, certainly um, administration is present and ready today to answer any questions you may have. It's perfectly fine to go ahead and ask those. I'm not ready today. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I would love to set up some time <laughs> for a meeting so I could get ready. Thank okay. you. Um, okay, anything else on 5.4? Okay, moving on to 5.5, .5, amendment to policy DJED, bids and quotations. Any questions or comments from the board? Um, I do have a couple of questions and a, and a statement. Um, I, wonder if we could, I wonder if we could have that conversation now that Mr. Parker discussed uh, or, or um, proposed. I think there's a discussion we should have as a committee um, and really all weigh in on. Um, I think it, it's a really big impact on, um, could potentially have a big impact on the way we do business. So I'd like to have the conversation now in public if possible. So can we talk about um, first, just sort of give a general overview of the sort of reasoning behind definitely 5.5, .5, the changes increasing the thresholds um, above where they are, doubling them in some case, uh, increasing by 50% in other cases. Store's coming up. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, with regards to the, um, the changes, of course, we're following uh, not only legislative changes uh, but also the uh, procurement department at the state. And with that, we don't mirror everything that the state procurement department does, or we would have to do everything that they do. So we have our own policies uh, as well as our own procedures. Uh, in addition to the procedures, uh, or in regards to the procedures, over the last year and a half, I'd say we've been working on those to update them as an organization. And so for the portion of our contracts management, where the uh, threshold change from 50 to 75 would come into play, uh, that is to go, again, that's the trigger to go to an RFP. So as we look at what we have to do from just an RFP standpoint and a transaction standpoint, uh, in putting professional services in line with all of the other things that we do, uh, looking at the additional work we have with school facility preservation program, we have a lot more RFPs than we will have had in any year prior to this. So that's one of the reasons. Inflation is a reason, uh, and I, but I think all of these sort of culminated in um, our procurement team looking at this, looking at why the state changed, seeing that they've recognized uh, cost index changes, things of those nature, uh, and just try to follow whatever the current guidance is. We're looking at other districts around the state. I think we would be one of the sooner adopters of some of these changes, but I know that they're looking at those as well. Uh, other folks don't have the school facility preservation program like we do, so we're a little bit unique in that work just as a procurement department goes and the efforts that they have to put forth in order to make purchasing happen uh, on an ongoing basis. But it is fairly limited, again, as the trigger for, for RFP. So when we think of contract evaluation, that also goes to vendor evaluation. It goes to how we put out a scope of service. And so when you're putting that scope out, this doesn't mean that any contract below 75,000 just gets automatically done. It still is a scope is put together, our procurement department gets involved, we look at multiple vendors. We offer uh, from our DBE list, certainly in our, our business development program, making sure that our local and DBE vendors have opportunities and are aware of this. So we're trying to expand those services, and this is one of those where we just saw, uh, again, following some, uh, some other guidelines and what other uh, departments have done around the state, but trying to fold that into the work that we have to do here at the district. Uh, with regards to materials as well, we're gonna be doing a lot more material procurement for some of, again, all the big projects are sort of winding down, the new schools, those pieces. Now we're looking into a lot of the maintenance pieces, and so we're gonna be doing some of that work ourselves, some of it's outsourced, uh, and again, just looking at the overall impact to the department. But again, we have to have good contract management, and that's on the front end and on the back end. Uh, we discussed today what, you know, making sure we have a return on investment looks like and part of that is vendor evaluation uh, and making sure that we're getting uh, value for the dollars that we spend. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Can we talk about consulting and professional services contracts? I oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add one thing with regard to materials and supplies. Mm -hmm. um, in large part, we do defer to um, to the state for and for state contracts around materials and supplies as well. So we don't typically <laughs> have to do a lot of bidding that our bidding of that ourselves. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that. A lot of that stuff is procured on a state level, and we're able to access um, those solicitations for mm -hmm. a lot of the things we need. Thank you. That's helpful information for sure. Um, can we talk about consulting services and professional service contracts that we currently um, have? Um, what's the universe there? How many of those contracts would you say we have at any given time? It really depends. I think a lot of them are cyclical. We've had several in accounting, for example, over the last two years for some support services. Uh, there are some public relations uh, contracts that we have. We've had strategic planning, I believe some, uh, some of our DEI work, those were consulting contracts. Uh, we have larger ones, and again, those, uh, those are the ones you see go out to bid related to the system-wide needs program. Uh, again, those are larger in nature, past that threshold, either 50 or 75. Those are uh, several hundred thousand dollar agreements. So, but of the smaller ones, um, I don't have a number offhand, but you know, we, again, we manage those, and we're managing those different. I would also add that we've started using one of the modules in Munis in the last year to be tracking these on an ongoing basis, not only for renewals, but then again, on the vendor management side as well. But we could look it up and see how many we currently have uh, in place. Is that something that you, uh, the public could find anywhere? They could ask. OK, um, but it's not on our that. website who we're currently doing business with? No. OK. Um, can we talk about? how often um, contracts are let under the emergency provisions? Is that common? No, say? we've really had that under um, COVID and mm -hmm. with, uh, related to, I think the last one was with Ida. Okay. The last one where we had to deal with that. And a lot of that was, again, the, the ability for the board to meet was one piece of it, but sure. then also to put things in place uh, on short term. Those are, those are uh, fairly rare. Okay. Um, what what is the general sort of timeline for something that is going out for RFP? What, what, what does that timeline look, you know, sort of from developing the scope until it comes to the board for approval? Um, with, uh, with service contracts, it has to go in the paper twice um, during, that, during that period. Again, I, I, I shared the slide for that, but there is an, we, we have a calendar now, and, and uh, Mr. Lucius that runs our procurement department now is, is backs into that with staff to say, if you need something, for example, by the November board meeting, here's the trigger date to do, have the scope ready, here's uh, our first meeting, here's bid opening, all of those pieces, here's how we set the evaluation team. So we have that and can certainly provide it, uh, what all those timelines are. But is it like six 60, months, 60, three 60 months? 60 to 90 days. Okay. So that's pretty, that's pretty quick for government work, 30 to 60 days. 60 to 90. Okay. Um, and this, uh, just to be clear, the legislation allows for us to go up to these amounts but doesn't require that change, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, I think we need to strike a balance between getting work done as a district and transparency. Um, I. At this time, I think that this policy misses that mark. I think we're, it's a little out of balance. Um, I definitely understand the financial burdens, and I'm not saying that there don't need to be any changes, but I think that this legislation gives us opportunity to look holistically, as Mr. Parker said, at our procurement policies, at our practices, and look at where we may need to adjust. Um, I think we need to live up to our goals uh, as a board of transparency. Um, but also, you know, respond to economic pressure. I, I get that. I think it's a balance, and I think um, we need to, as a board, des decide where we want to strike that balance. Um, I personally would like to see more um, information given to us about what professional services contracts there are out there, um, what the scope is. Um, I would like to understand better what the contract management looks like. Um, what it looks like um, at the end of the contract, too. What are we doing to evaluate that contractor to make sure that we're memorializing 
um, that work, um, especially in high turnover departments of the of of the district. Um, make sure that we're we're memorializing things and not losing information uh, when we lose staff. So I I would like to see um, a consideration for more more reporting on the work um, if we're going to increase these thresholds. So that's my jumping off point for the conversation. Ms. Dr. Batiste. Yes, thank you, Ms. Baudouin. I concur with the, ass the assessment that you just made, and I think that it not only promotes transparency for the public, but it also allows us as board members to be f fin uh, fiduciarily responsible for the administration of the district. And I'm not suggesting through my comments that anything is going sure. awry, Perfect. but I just think that that would be really great for us because in our role as board members, we need to know where the contracts are, who's doing what, why, and we do understand that we have a, a downsized central office, so it will be inevitable that we will need assistance and support from other people. So I concur with that assessment. Um, Mr. Parker? If I may, um, just to give some more context for my comments earlier about wanting to sit down and learn more about this and have, have detailed conversations, I think they're very much in line with your comments, uh, Board Member Bodwin. I also, um, as we are talking about our procurement policies, I would like to have a broader discussion about, you know, we talk a lot as a board about our DBE policy. I'd also be interested to learn more about um, what our procurement policies are around uh, entities that maybe have been found guilty of labor violations uh, or wage theft or something like that. If we're talking about building wealth in the black and brown community, we need to be talking about partnering with organizations that are not stealing from employees, many of whom are black and brown themselves. Um, I also, so that that's one thing. I just want to learn more about what our procurement policies are. I, I apologize for not being an expert on procurement, uh, but maybe by the end of this process, I can be one. Uh, and, and also, just generally, my orientation, I think, is inclined to more oversight over these contracts than less, or a, a smaller dollar amount than just going up to what the law allows. Now, in the, in the conversations that we have, I may be convinced otherwise. But just kind of my initial take is like, we don't necessarily need to go up to the limit of what the law allows. And I just wanted to make sure that that was clear for y'all uh, on the administrative side as we have the conversation moving forward that that's where I'm coming from. Um, and you can inform me accordingly. Yeah, I got a, I got two. Mr. Ashley. Yeah, I got two things. Um, one, it sounded like whatever just came down the dais Sounds expensive. Uh, sounds like we may need to add an FTE to do the work of putting this on whatever platform because we haven't before all the things. I'm, I'm not saying that because clearly I'm not the superintendent. I'm not working there on a day-to-day -day basis. My mind just tells me it sounded like money. Uh, so the second thing I want to acknowledge is that, you know, I think to President Parker's point, I'm curious about the number of DBEs who would receive, who currently receive these types of opportunities that are not under the bid threshold, that are under the bid threshold. Yeah, so, you know, then we get a sense of like, oh, it's pretty fair, it's, you know, then we like, all right, well, you know, that's a, good, that's, a good, that's a good situation and we can figure that out and I think we'll have a better sense of how we feel about this. We do have the DBE results from last year forthcoming. Uh, uh, Mr. Temple's been working on that, so. Thank you, Mr. Ashley. Any other comments or questions? Um, given that this is a first read, um, and I think there we could have a better informed conversation maybe um, as a as a committee um, what, when we're when we have some more information. Um, I don't know if we want to move this. I don't know if we want to do that between first and second read, or if we want to um, maybe have a discussion at the next policy committee meeting and then move move forward. Then is that possible? I don't know the procedure here. Like wait a month before moving on to second reading, or certainly the board 
policy around policy changes allows for that. Okay. You know, if you believe that you need to spend more time with a policy, um, next month we get here again and you decide, yeah, we're not ready yet, it could be held over um, for longer okay. or deferred for another month, whatever um, the committee's pleasure is at that time. Okay. Um, uh, so I would like to propose that we um, next month at the policy meeting have a conversation, answer some of these questions that my colleagues have asked and have just a conversation about where we are as a board about um, some of these changes um, and not move to second reading yet. Any objection to from the, I don't know if I'm, I don't know the procedure, but there are there any questions, objections from the board? My, my assumption is you're going to have to actually uh, put forward a motion if you're going to. Like to defer? Yeah. Or, okay. Or like with specificity to what it is that you want to happen. Okay. So, um, I'll Sorry, move, quick, go quick ahead. point of order. Board council, is that accurate? Do we need to take action on it? Or I think the message is clear that we would like more time with this. Yes, um, we, that's my understanding. I think as it relates to next month's policy committee meeting, you have time to determine what it is you want to go on that agenda and whether you want um, the amendment to this policy relate. Well, I'm going to say it sounds like four. 5.4 and 5.5 because they kind of go together. But as it relates to the procurement related policies, it sounds like you want time to have more discussions and you certainly have time between now and that next meeting to determine how this will be presented, if it will be presented at the next board meeting. So no motion is necessary. Not at this time. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that clarification and thank you, um, Mr. Gay and Ms. Moss for y'all for your um, uh, information here. Very helpful. Um, I'm going to move on to 5.6 unless anybody has any questions. This is, oh no, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Amendment to policy GAAA equal employment opportunity. Um, any questions or comments from the board? I think you're on. I'm sorry. sorry you you read 5.7, but 5.6 is. The amendment to policy ED. I see it here. Okay. 5.6, amendment to policy EDD, school bus scheduling and routing. Any comments here from the board? Okay. Seeing none, 5.7, amendment to policy GAAA, equal employment opportunity. I, I do have one comment. Mr. On Parker. Related to, it's related to 5.7, 5.8, and then I think one of the 5.20s. Mm -hmm. um, these are in response. I just wanted to point out that a lot of these changes are in response to the Crown Act that was passed by mm -hmm. Representative Candace Newell. Um, and I just wanted to celebrate the fact that we are able to put these into our policies because of a state requirement. Uh, I just want to congratulate Representative Newell on getting the Crown Act through the legislature, which I have to imagine initially was skeptical of this. Um, and just the tremendous lift that she did to get that through. And it is you know, we shouldn't have had to wait for state legislation for this, but I am thrilled that state legislation does exist. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Any other comment? Okay, so 5.8, amendment to policy GAMB, employee dress code. Um, 5.9, amendment to policy GAMFD, mandatory COVID-19 vaccination. 5.10, Amendment to Policy GBDB, Employment of Retired Personnel. 5.11, Amendment to Policy GBQ, Retirement. 5.12, Amendment to Policy GBRIB, Sick Leave. 5.13, Amendment to Policy GBRID, Military Leave. 5.14, Amendment to Policy ID Curriculum. 5.15, Amendment to Policy IDBC, Child Assault Awareness. 5.16, Amendment to Policy IDCC Kindergarten. 
5.17, Amendment to Policy IDDFA, Special Education Advisory Council. 5.18, this is a new policy, IDDFC, Cameras in Special Education Classrooms. Just one, one question mm -hmm. um, for our general counsel. Just to make sure, this, as you mentioned, is a result of a law that was passed by the legislature. Yes. Um, was there any funding attached to this? Yes, okay. um, and that is why they came back and required adoption of a related policy by the end of this year, because funding was identified. Um, and that being the case, everybody's going to be able to move forward with complying if there are requests made for cameras. Great, and charter schools are eligible for that funding, I'm assuming? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. Any other? Okay, thank you. 5.19, Amendment to Policy JAA Equal Education Opportunities. 5.20, uh, Amendment to Policy JBA, Compulsory School Attendance Ages. 5.21, Amendment to Policy JBC, School Admission. 5.22, Amendment to Policy JBD, Student Absences and Excuses. 5.23, Amendment to JCD, Student Conduct. 5.24, Amendment to Policy JCDAB, Student Alcohol and Drug Use. 5.25, Amendment to Policy JCDAC, Dangerous Weapons. 5.26, Amendment to Policy JCDAF, Bullying and Hazing. 5.27, Amendment to Policy JCDB, Student Dress Code. 5.28, Amendment to Policy JD, Discipline. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that um, in 5.28 in particular, uh, you know, I really appreciate that they, that there's, um, you know, a, a clear, there's a clear way in which we want discipline and disciplinary measures to happen. It, you know, from referral to counsel to pure mediation to, you know, restorative justice practices you know, there is a move in the right direction here. And, you know, I think most of our schools are largely doing this work. And so I thought it was really thoughtful um, uh, that it was outlined in a way which it, it currently is. So thank you. Thank you. Amendment to policy JDD suspension. Um, 5.30 amendment to policy JDE expulsion. 5.31, Amendment to Policy JGC, Student Health Services. 5.32, Amendment to Policy JGCD, Administration of Medicine. 5.33, New Policy JM, Student Voter Registration. 5.34, Amendment to Policy JQA, Expectant and Parenting Students. I'll comment here. I, um, this is another one I think that um, I'm grateful for the legislature for moving forward, um, Representatives Landry and Freeman, for this um, really helping our parenting students balance um, their parenting responsibilities and their education. I think it um, is a really good move forward. 5.35, Amendment to Policy JR, Student Privacy and Education Records. Uh, 5.36, <clears throat> New Policy LEH, Patriotic Organizations. Mr. Parker? Uh, just, if I could, General Counsel, if you could please just send a list of, you, I think you mentioned that the, the, there's a list of patriotic organizations. I love my country, but I also know that many people use patriotism as the guise for things that I consider to be nefarious. Yeah, so I'll send it. <laughs> if you could send it. It's a wild one. For them. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, organizations on that list. Um, 
And okay. just to I share a little it. more about that, um, currently um, federal legislation it currently exists that, um, and it's called the Equal Access to Public School Facilities Act, it, and it basically provides that if you provide access to any of the organizations on that list, then you have to provide access to the others. But it doesn't require you to provide access to any. But our legislature has seen fit to make it a requirement. Um, you don't have the option, as under federal law, um, to decide to not provide access to any if you're concerned about who may be on the list or some other reason. So that's the difference. At a state level, um, it's being mandated now. Got it. And, and I know that we're talking about our district policies right mm -hmm. now, but does this one apply to charter schools as well? It does not, not the state version. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, um, that's the end. Um, thank you all for your patience and participation. I'm gonna give it over to Mr. Ashley for the Finance Committee. Awesome. We are now at, uh, thank you so much, Chairwoman Bowen. We're now at the Finance Committee update. Um, we are at 6.1. Um, I'm going to uh, defer to Mr. Gates to take us through uh, this, this month's finance update. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, so for this month's uh, Finance Committee agenda, we have our uh, August financial statements, our current Treasury position, and just an update on our DLFA funding uh, for this fiscal year. Uh, when we look at the financial statements for the month of August 2022, our income, uh, our revenues for the period were $1.67 million, uh, just under budget of $1.7 uh, we had pretty strong earnings on investment. Again, we're in that period where we had a little bit of cash before we get into the dry cycle, which is in the fall through December, which is what our RAND supports. But while we have it and while the rates have increased significantly at LAMP, we've tucked a bunch into there. So we, we made about $175,000 last month on investments. And as long as we keep the money in there, we're earning about $9,000 a day. So uh, we're looking to that to, to bolster some of our, of our other areas. So. You know, while we have it, we try to invest it, and that's just, you know, that's just one of the areas where we try to make up for a little bit. Um, in our Harris and our EC millage uh, overall, we've moved that revenue assumption to the end of the year. We previously had it as divided by 12, so we don't get that money to the end of the year. So if you see a difference on the income statement related to those. Uh, and then our indirect costs are under budget as far as revenue goes uh, by about a half a million. We have claims, and we're doing quarterly claims now and pushing the schools in our LEA to do monthly claims so that we're, we're turning that revenue over faster, uh, getting the money back to them more timely as well as uh, booking those indirect costs. So we had a lot done by uh, the due date of September 30th for the first quarter, and we'll be booking those associated indirect costs soon. For our expenses, we were just under $2 million, and we were 33% under budget expenses for the month. Again, at the beginning of the year, we have a lot of larger contracts, especially related to system-wide needs program and others that aren't really underway. We haven't made payments towards them. So those service uh, agreements are a little bit under uh, so far for the fiscal year. Uh, otherwise, the net change in fund balance for the period was uh, a loss of $323,000. Uh, the balance sheet for August 31, 22, we had cash of uh, 40.9 million, total assets of 55.1, and in the balance sheet on the asset side, uh, cash and accounts receivable decreased month over month by 8 and 35 percent respectively, but we went up on prepaid. That prepaid is related to our payment for property insurance for the year. So we prepay it, and then it holds a, um, a non-spendable portion of our fund balance for the year, so those draw down monthly. Uh, against each other as we go through the year. But the liabilities for the period were 4.7, and our fund balance currently is $50,342,852, of which $40 million is for emergencies, 2.6 is system-wide, and then the, the difference there between that and 50 is, again, the portion that's related to the prepaid insurance. Uh, this is just a snapshot of our Treasury position for Again, the month ended August 22. These are uh, all of our bank accounts, including the bottom two, which is where you see our investments. 
Uh, in LAMP, we had 65.6 million, and in our um, CNF TD Bank, we had $38.9 million. We have some longer term investments again. I know we've been through that. Uh, we have a, a quarterly summary coming up for you all at the next board meeting uh, to look at those, but that's where we have those longer maturity opportunities. Uh, which is good in this time because we're starting to see some some payback on those that we bought uh, about six to 12 months ago and they were two year one and a half to two year investments and we're starting to see that payback uh, because a lot of what we invest in is tied to unfortunately uh, you're betting against the house and the increase in, in interest rates uh, on dlfa funding as you all know when we got to the end of fy22 we still hadn't received the data in order to true up our DLFA payments to schools. And, and so this results in, in several problems. First of all, if you're a school that had an increase in enrollment, you were underfunded. If you had a decrease in enrollment, you were overfunded. The district's out money. Uh, and so it, it's a challenge. We've worked with the state to get that data sooner. Uh, but in the meantime, we've had to look at some solutions because when we got to the end of FY22, uh, we'd overfunded 28 different schools for about six and a half million dollars. And then we have to go back and try to get that money back. We don't have a mechanism. We have a communication with the schools, So we can't just draft it out of the MFP. Um, that's going to require uh, another instrument that we've been discussing, some type of MOU or agreement for a, for a funding cycle. But uh, we gave the schools the opportunity to pay us directly or have it reduced from their uh, from their MFP agreements for uh, August and September. So we've gotten the money back. There's two closeout schools uh, that have not paid us yet, but uh, otherwise we've received most of that money back. But every year it creates this problem and it's it's slow data, uh, which is out of our control. Uh, so we've we've met with school finance leaders since August and, and even over the summer to discard, uh, to discuss some opportunities to to change this for us and for the schools because it really doesn't benefit anyone. If you had the money, you have to give it back. If you didn't get the money, you've been you know, relying on other sources to get through those periods. So uh, what we've been looking at is you know, adjusting the, the funding process to look at the 10-1 count. Last year, we didn't get the October 1 count until the end of March, and we didn't get the February count until the end of June. So that data, that official certified data, it's tough to come by, and so what we're looking at uh, Javier Cortez and our finance team has, has sent out a survey to schools. And so we're looking at where they're sitting at 10-1 according to them. And we can look at also on our side, on the enrollment side. So we're looking at that data in order to do some mid-year adjustments that are outside of the regular cycle. So this, this timeline breaks it down uh, as far as what that means. But we're going to take that, that snapshot data from, from the 10-1 counts that schools give us and look and see if we have any major adjustments to make. Because if not, we'll be funding schools like we did last year off of the previous year's February 1 count for 18 months you know, after that time. And it's, it's just not working, uh, from a, not only from a cash flow standpoint, but it affects every school in the city. So it's certainly not, it, it's really not related to us as much as it's related to you know, what, it, what it does to the schools throughout the city. So that's that first part when we look at the student count that you'll see up on the screen starting in October. You know, if we, if we see major variances there, we can adjust. We also already do forward funding for some schools that apply for it. So this fits in line with if schools are telling us that they're way off and they know that we're not getting the data, we certainly communicate all this. These slides are directly from our, our last finance leaders meeting where we talk through these, through these issues. But um, again, it's, it, we're trying to resolve the problem by ourselves while we're, while we're waiting on the data to clean it up so that the year-end true up isn't as much of a, a mess as it, as it has been the last couple of years. And we're also hoping that you know, the state's able to get the data sooner uh, than they have. And we, again, we've had those conversations uh, with Ed Finance at the state and, and others. So, uh, But you see outside of that student count, there's a lot of other pieces that go into our, um, our, our monthly allocations and this just again spells out we already know that MFP is complicated but there's a lot of different other metrics that go into it and these are the different snapshots and this is also something that you see in our finance guidebook that we have um, uh, posted and you know again helping to explain how we do funding here uh, in New Orleans because it is a little bit different and this is just the uh, just another slide of, you know on what that looks like these are other pieces forward funding private facility funding continuation of prior year pay raises and what is in the boxes in the month is the snapshot data that we take in order to make those payments until we get to the end of the year when we can finally make the true up so there's a lot of true up and if you've seen the mfp payment sheets but it's not just one line of per pupil funding of course it's all the dlfa weights 
uh, and then the state, the level four, which is outside of what we calculate for our two percent authorizer fee, and that's all the pay raises, supplemental course allocation, all those other pieces. So, um, those are just the data parts that we use. Uh, and then finally, again, we had this uh, in our last finance leaders meeting, and just looking at our long-term revenues forecasts, and there's a lot on here, and and graphs and, and things of that nature, but the takeaway is that um, our local base is improving. You know, we've, we've made it through that cycle with the impact from COVID and, and everything else, but you're gonna see less state revenue because that is a flat per pupil and we have less pupils. So that's going to go down in, in a gross number and that's because on a per pupil basis, again, we have, we have fewer uh, pupils in the city. So that's just what we're looking at for right now. Again, these projections are, are projections, but we need to look multiple years out, and this is just one of the elements that we use and, and to help schools plan a little bit uh, in the out years because we're all dealing with what that FY25 looks like. So uh, we just share this information as we get it. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Colleagues, do you have any questions for Mr. Gay? I see uh, Mrs. Zervigan. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ashley. Um, it looks like a pretty sizable jump in local revenue. Yes. Um, considering the changing economic circumstance, I mean, how solid is that right now? <laughs> we, we use some different, you know, there's the revenue conferences and things of that nature. We track sales tax, and it went up over the summer. We had a nice spike over the summer. It's back down to that, like, $11.5 million mark. I think we hit a couple of 14 and a half millions this summer, which was great. Um, I think that is impacted by a lot of other factors that I think we're dealing with as a city overall, but the ad valorem base is good as well. We certainly need to keep an eye on any ITEP exemption proposals and, and things of mm -hmm. that nature. There's some of those uh, releases of commercial property from the ad valorem base that, again, is outside of our control, but, um, you know, the sales tax has really rebounded, and that's, you know, that's what we are able to track the most, and with ad valorem, we will have another in 2024, another full reassessment. Uh, which will occur, but you know, during this process of, I think, you know, high price home sales, I know I bought a house two years ago and suddenly the assessed value was exactly the sales price. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's it's how some of those work. And so that's helped increase the base as well uh, overall. But we, we look at a lot of different metrics for it, but certainly sales tax is the, is the most current that we, that we look at. So there will be the opportunity to, to perhaps try to be mindful and somewhat conservative as to not have to have a true down, I'll call it, instead of a true up at the end of the year. That's right, yes, exactly. No, we, we, we play on the conservative sides. So. All right, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Zervagan, uh, Board Member Reams. Yes, Ms., uh, Mr. Gray, Gay. Yes, um, with this MFP that we're losing due to um, that low enrollment, is this a trend throughout the state, or are we being impacted more than other parishes in the state? No parish by parish, but certainly other parishes are dealing with a decline in enrollment. I mean, it's Louisiana wide. I think it's it's down overall, and you know we see the same birth rate bubble that's that's flowing through our city as as in other areas. So, it, and this gets into the other enjoyable part of the MFP equation, where you have that local state uh, balance of you know of poverty index and and those items to where if you get if you have more local, you get less state, and so we're always watching out for that as well. But it's certainly a trend that we're seeing across the state and across the nation, uh, so lower enrollment overall. I, I, I've seen schools. it nationally too, mm -hmm. but what are we doing to prepare for 2025? Right this now, a lot loss. of forecasting and, and planning. Um, you know, we have, to, we have to just match what we have for revenues, and if we have opportunities, certainly if we have opportunities to avoid reductions in our sales tax on our own. Again, you know, we've, we've, the board has taken action on ITEP applications as that's become available. Previously, it wasn't until, um, I believe, Governor Edwards uh, made that move a couple years ago that we actually have the input. So anytime we can prevent uh, reductions to our own taxes, I think we should. President Parker. Um, just a couple of, one clarifying question and, and a couple other kind of broader questions. The first is the delay in differentiated funding. You mentioned we didn't have numbers until March or something uh, like that. We Enrollment March numbers. on the October count and June 25th on the uh, February 1 count. And those, those delays were at the state level, not at the local level? Is That's that right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. we report, schools report up to them and then they report back to us. Got it. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that was the case. Um, 
And then to, I think to one of the points that Ms. Eames was making and connected to some of my comments from earlier in the, in the meeting, I would love as Mr. Simmons comes back to us with uh, information on district optimization, some kind of uh, associated financial impact of our expected number of students and what that means for our state revenue. Um, I think that would be helpful and help us and help our schools and help the community understand the financial impact of a decline in enrollment. Um, and then uh, broadly, uh, the you know June 30th has passed. Our audit is due at the end of this calendar year. That's correct. Just to get get used to this question, it's going to be a monthly question. They're here today. Are we are we on track to yes. uh, completing our audit in a timely manner? Any concerns that the board should be aware of? No concerns at this point. We've um, they we began work. Um, they send out a PBC list early on. We start working on that and give them a bunch of stuff, and then they come on site to do the testing. They started last week on site. They're here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uh, on site. They're here today uh, and through the end of the month of October. And so, you know, the schedule is if we can get the on site work testing done, then the month of November is really going back through the financial statements, uh, looking at any findings that they have, responding to those findings, uh, creating action plans. But ultimately, the goal is to have it by um, the board meeting uh, in December so that it can be looked at and reviewed and then submitted. Great. Thank you. As, I, of, right um, now, as of right now, no red flags. No, great. We've waived several of love those to in the it. past, so um, I don't see any currently. We'd love to hear it. Uh, well, I just want to say, um, you know, you're usually the one up here taking arrows from the board. I, I know there's a whole staff of people that, that are working with you. Very much. Um, and just we're all very grateful for the work that they do and the, and the leaps forward that we've made in our finances over the last couple of years. So I just wanted to state that publicly that we're grateful for your work and we're grateful for the work of everyone on your team. Let's get real Thank quick uh, before I, I let you sit, uh, because I'm about to do what you just did. Uh, and thank you for the notes. Um, the the process by which we receive the back end information from the state from our, our local schools that have their own LEA stuff right um, is the is there a way to report both to us and the state at the same time or is there legislation that has to take place what needs to because my assumption is that schools would welcome the opportunity to make sure that they are financially in the right place and don't owe us if they could do right. that is my assumption. Uh, now look, that could be a wrong assumption. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I see school leaders in a the room, they're looking at me sort of with a grimace. I don't know what it means. I'm, I'm also blind, well, so let me not, let me not acknowledge that that's a great, so. that could have been a real good smile. Let me not do that. Uh, very joy in the back is what I'm hearing. Um, uh, so is there, is there something that needs to take place or, or you know, what, what is the thought here? Well, as individual LEAs, as you know, they report individually to the state. Yep. So uh, changing that mechanism, I, I'm not sure the, the pathway for that yep. exactly. And that's why we're doing that survey for right now. So we can, what we can true up, we can true up um, in a soft way until we get the, the firm numbers back from the state that the verification of the students, which we don't perform, but knowing the information is, is really what we need to do to make adjustments. We have the ability to make adjustments. We just didn't know the information. So we're starting with that survey. Uh, I think we can get into a more formalized funding agreement, as I mentioned, uh, going into next year, possibly. We're working on some drafts of that. Um, but I, I, I just don't know the trigger to change reporting to both. Because like we get their AFRs yeah. once they're complete. They're submitting those to the state right now and, and back and forth with the state. Once they're done, we get a copy of those. Uh, but we don't get that information directly uh, in the process. Yeah, and maybe it's just voluntary. You know, it's not, you know, we're not asking the force anybody to do anything. Right. It's just to make sure that we're able to do a better job of, you know, that money stuff on the backside. And again, we, we do forward fund if schools, you know, they submit that information to us and they think that they've either added a grade or, or have a significant increase in enrollment as well. And I think as you see, again, with everything that we have going on, <laughs> optimization wise, I think we'll see some, you know, some changes throughout the city in the next couple of years with that. That was a good use of that word. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ms. Gabe, we're going to move to 6.2. All right, um, moving on to action item 6.2, amendment to the action previously adopted regarding a award of RFQ number 23-0009 for independent contractors to provide 
physical therapy services. This happened when I was not here. Um, so recommended action. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board amends its previous action of September 22nd, 2022. No, I'm not blaming anybody. Accepting the qualification responses, meeting the specification terms and conditions for independent contractors to provide physical and therapy services from AMN Allied Services, LLC, Attain a Therapy, LLC, Jane Cavold, LBZ, Believe Rehab, Pediatric Development Services, and the Stepping Stones Group, LLC, in the amount not to exceed $400,000 for a period of one year with an option to renew two, ye two additional one-year periods and authorize the general counsel to prepare a contract for signatures of the board president and the contractor to add an additional inadvertently admitted qualified respondent orange tree staffing and to correct the total contracts amount to not exceed $462,000. Uh, $462, uh, may I have a motion to move action item 6.2 to the full board for consideration, please? So moved. I have a motion by Dr. Baptiste. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Eames. Uh, is there any cards? Any questions from the board? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that item moves on to the full board for consideration. Uh, let's move to action item 6.3, first extension of the lease for public lands, agriculture, grazing, trapping, hunting, and any other legitimate purposes. Um, recommended action is to recommend that the Orleans Parish School Board approves an extension of the lease for public lands, agriculture, grazing, trapping, hunting, and for any other legitimate purposes with the unknown past hunting club LLC for a one year period effective May 1st, 2022 through April 30th of 2023, excuse me, for the amount of $17,025 and authorizes general counsel to prepare the lease amendment for signature of the board president in the leasee. Uh, there's a rationale. Um, if the board needs me to provide the rationale, I'm, I am ready to do just that. Um, but if not, may I have a motion to move action item 6.3 to the full board? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Seams. I have a second by Ms. Bodwin. Uh, are there any comment cards? Any questions from the board? Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Um, action item 6.3 is moving on to the full board for consideration at Thursday's meeting. Action item 6.4, change order number two, blue frog plumbing plus draining for sewer replacement and sewer jetting initial service located at Francis Gaudet, Gaudet, excuse me. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves change order number two in the amount of $15,864 with Blue Frog plumbing and draining for sewer replacement and sewer jetting initial services at Francis Gaudet located at uh, 12,000 uh, Haynes Boulevard. May I have a motion to move action item 6.4 to the full board for consideration? I have a, a motion by Ms. Eames and a second by uh, Vice President Zervigan. Uh, are there any cards? Seeing none, any questions from my board colleagues? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion uh, passes on to the full board for consideration uh, on Thursday's meeting. Uh, remember, colleagues, we had an addition, no item, uh, 6.5 added to um, our agenda. Uh, and so uh, this item is amendment to uh, previous action regarding payment of resolved claims, judgments, and settlements. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board amends its previous action of September 22nd, 2022, relative to the payment of the, the resolved claims as follows. It is recommended that the Orleans Parish School Board approves the recommended distribution amount of $500,000 to be distributed toward the payment of unresolved claims, sets a resolution deadline of August 19th, 2022, and sets a negotiation period of November 1st, 2022, to close a business, uh, which is 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, November 30th, 2022. Uh, may I have a motion to move this on to the board board for consideration? So moved. I have a motion by uh, Ms. Bowen. Is there a second? Second. 
I have a second by President Parker. Uh, uh, any cards on this item? No, Mr. Ashley, I just wanted to say, I, I think you said this, but just in case, this is the Second Amendment. Yes, I apologize. Yes, the Second Amendment. Um, yes, I believe I did, but thank you. I, I think that was in the rationale, so I think you said it, but just, just in case, I know it's a lot. <laughs> awesome. All right, so we, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries for, for to the full board for consideration for Thursday's meeting. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a... I, I, was, I was attempting to abstain. Did you? The, I apologize. Is there an, uh, there's an abstention. There's, there's two abstentions. Let me be very clear. Board member Eames and board member Baptiste uh, abstained from the votes. Uh, and so just for clarity purposes, um, I believe that board member, Vice President Zervagon, myself, President Parker, and board member Bowen all voted in favor to move the action item to full for consideration, which gives us uh, the go on that. Awesome. All right. I think, I, uh, I think that's all I got for us. That's great. I'm going to actually welcome back, uh, I think, uh, board woman, yeah, board chairwoman uh, Bowen to go through property. Thank you, Mr. Ashley. Um, welcome back to the property committee meeting now. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Secures to give us our uh, capital and facilities update. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members and Superintendent Williams. Today I'll be presenting the October capital projects and facilities updates. For today's agenda, I will be updating the board on capital projects from, managed by both NOLA PS and the Recovery School District. And I will also provide a high level overview of the planned, unplanned, and emergency capital projects that are currently ongoing. First off, we have the McMain High School Auditorium uh, renovation that is ni progressing nicely. The historical ceiling and light fixtures installation have been completed. All scaffolding has been removed and the contractor is readying the auditorium to begin the seat installation that will be occurring next week. For the Douglas High School auditorium renovation, the auditorium seats are being installed at the balcony area. They are finalizing the installation of the marble in all restrooms and have completed the historical ceiling and lighting installation. This project is scheduled for substantial completion at the end of October, October early November. Moving on to the Recovery School District managed projects, the new construction of the Walter High School, Walter Cohen High School is anticipated to be substantially complete on Monday, October 24th. So we're super excited about that. The punch list is being established and they're scheduling the commissioning of the mechanical systems. The contractor is completing some interior painting and finalizing the installation of the millwork. And the board is scheduled to tour the new school on Tuesday, October 25th. The Rosemary Loving Elementary School renovation project has been granted temporary occupancy by the state fire marshal for the main building only. The contractor is working on the punch list items on floors one and two. The kitchen equipment has been delivered and installed and they are completing the installation of the seating in the auditorium. For the early learning center and the new gym, the contractor is working on the installation of the exterior windows and the plaster and siding installation are in progress for the early learning center, as well as the completion of the installation of the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing equipment for the new gym facility. The gym and early learning center are still scheduled to be completed this December with the school moving in January, 2023. Dr. Alice Joffrey High School renovation project is moving along quickly and is ahead of schedule. The contractor is 90% complete for the storefront glass installation. The painting of the stairwells and the installation of carpet tile floors are complete. The rear, the rear parking lot is being formed up and ready for the concrete pour. Although con contractually the substantial completion is scheduled for February 2023, this project is anticipated to be completed at the end of this year. 
So the next update is an overview of where we are with all of our planned, unplanned, and emergency capital projects. So what are our, what are our planned COP projects? These are our first year projects that are identified through the facility condition assessments and fall within our approved priority structure. We currently have about 21 planned projects where 19 are in the architect engineer engagement phase and the two and, and two are in the actual design phase. Unlike the planned projects, unplanned projects are projects that occur unexpectedly and are also identified at as an approved priority. The district is currently working on eight unplanned projects, four are in design or selection phase, three are in active design, and one is currently in the construction phase. And lastly, we have our emergency projects that we have been tackling over the last year, which consist of Hurricane Ida projects and the emergency fire and flood that occurred at Dwight Eisenhower and Medard Nelson last October. These two projects, along with the Douglas, Hurricane Ida, Phase 1 and 2, have been completed. Those two projects, four, four of the Hurricane Ida projects have kicked off and are in construction, while the remaining Ida projects, one remaining Ida project is still in design, and that's a roof replacement that won't happen until next year. This concludes my report. Be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments, colleagues? Mr. Ashley? Yeah, I just um, I have a question about uh, when we are set to receive the update on what we're doing with access buildings and, um, you know, with communities. I know that there's a lot of policy changes happening with that. We're trying to make sure we get the right answers. I know Tiffany's team's been working on this, and you all have been working on this, excuse me, um, for months, I think, at this point. And so are we expecting a big presentation in the next coming I believe Ms. Delco is going to probably present something in November, but we'll confirm. Great. That'd be great. I, um, I get a lot of calls from people trying to figure out what to do with these buildings. <laughs> and I'm like, we are going to have an answer. <laughs> uh, so thank you. The good news is um, uh, their team was able to hire a director of capital planning, which is a position that they've been trying to fill for a long time. Um, and so that's going to take a lot of the pressure off of um, the rest of the team um, so that that person will be able to really be run point on this process, which will be great. Um, it is, I think, going to slow it down maybe a month or two because this person is on, get, being onboarded and, and everything. Um, but I think ultimately it'll be a better result um, because we'll we'll have we'll have folks that are able to focus on it. So I'm really excited about that. We've they've been trying to fill that position for a long time. Absolutely. Skyla Wilson, she's here. Oh, she's welcome. our new director. Oh, well. Hi. Miss Wilson, we've been waiting for you for a long yeah. time. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Answer to our prayers. We welcomed her. We're so excited. So. <laughs> Any other? Mr. Parker. Yeah, just a, um, a quick question. Um, I'm looking at a lot of projects for this fiscal year, which is great. Um, I'm also just wondering, as we continue with the district optimization um, planning, um, you know, it just, I think it is natural that we don't want to spend $250,000 on a chiller if we don't see ourselves being in that building in the 2024 school year. So just if, if you could just can, uh, keep us updated on facilities decisions as part of the district optimization uh, process as well, that'd be great. Absolutely. It's definitely a critical piece. Anyone else? I'm excited uh, to see how many of our uh, these buildings completed on time or ahead of schedule. That's great. Um, I really, you know, I'm glad to see so many of our students will be moving into higher quality, better buildings um, as you know as soon as this January and uh, in the next six to twelve months. So that's really exciting. Yeah, all our FEMA projects are scheduled, the McMain and Douglas Auditorium, as well as, obviously, um, Alice Joffrey, CTE, and, and Cohen. All of that is going to be completed, hopefully, by January 2023. So all of those FEMA projects should be done. So we're excited to really focus on the SFPP plan and unplanned projects. Oh, good. So we'll still have things to talk about in committee. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. <Okay>. Absolutely. <laughs> OK. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Secures. Um, I think that concludes our uh, agenda for the property committee meeting. I'll turn it over to President Parker. 
All right, thank you so much. We are now moving on to item 8.1, which is our adjournment. Before we do that, I just want to say uh, I I love the engagement that our board has shown throughout this meeting. We clearly have a very engaged, detail-oriented board, which is not always the case um, in cities around the country. Uh, and we also have just tremendous district staff that are able to answer some difficult questions on uh, quickly and uh, follow up as appropriate. So I just want to commend everybody for for their engagement today. Uh, okay, now item eight point one. There are no further no further items on the agenda. May I have a motion to adjourn? So it's been moved by Mr. Ashley, seconded by Board Member Bodwin. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? I don't know how you possibly could be. The time is now three fifty-eight p.m. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>